When it comes to personal money, investing might stand out as one of the more complicated concepts. However, it is also one of the most important foundational elements in achieving financial independence and growing wealth. Despite the fact that it may appear to be frightening, from the alphabet soup of phrases such as individual retirement accounts, IRAs, and 400 and ONEX, to keeping track of the most recent market fluctuations, having a fundamental understanding of the subject will make you feel more confident and more at ease when beginning. How to Start Investing At its most fundamental level, investing can be understood as the act of choosing where you want to go on your financial journey and then matching those goals to the appropriate investments that will assist you in reaching those goals. Knowing your relationship with risk and being able to effectively manage it over time are both included in this. When you have a clear idea of what it is that you desire, all you need to do is dive in. You have the option of investing on your own or with the assistance of a financial advisor who is more experienced in the field. In the following, we will go over each of the most important procedures that will assist you in getting started with investing. 1. Decide your investment goals. Before you make the decision to register an account and start evaluating the many investing opportunities available to you, you should first think about your overall objectives. Are you interested in making investments for the long term, or do you want your portfolio to create money for you directly? Having this knowledge will reduce the amount of investment opportunities that are available and make the process of investing more straightforward. Think about what your ultimate objective is with this money. Is it to save for retirement, to make a down payment on a house within the next five years, or to spend it for something else entirely? According to Lauren Eastrad, a certified financial planner and certified financial analyst who works as a portfolio manager for TruePoint Wealth Council. When you have a clear understanding of your objectives and the timeframes for achieving them, you will be better able to evaluate the level of risk you are willing to take and which investment accounts should be given priority. If, for instance, you intend to invest your money for retirement, you should select a vehicle that gives favorable tax treatment such as an individual retirement account IRA or a 401, provided that your employer provides such a vehicle. But you might want to reconsider putting all of your money that is designated for investment into a 401, because you won't be able to access that money until you reach the age of 59 and a half or else you will be subject to penalty fees, with a minor number of exceptions. Additionally, you should avoid investing your emergency fund in a brokerage account because it is difficult to get your hands on the money in the event that you require it in a hurry. Additionally, if you are in need of cash during a period in which the market is experiencing a decline, you may wind up losing money since you will be compelled to sell at a lower price. 2. Select Investment Vehicle Following the establishment of your objectives, you will need to make a decision on the investment vehicles, which are also sometimes referred to as investing accounts. It is important to keep in mind that numerous accounts might complement one another in order to achieve a single goal. In the event that you are interested in taking a more hands-on approach to the process of creating your portfolio, a brokerage account is the proper location to begin. The power to purchase and sell stocks, mutual funds, and exchange-traded funds ADFs, is provided to you by brokerage accounts. There is no restriction on the amount of money you may invest, there is no limit on your income, and there are no limitations about when you can withdraw the money. This gives you a great deal of flexibility. One of the disadvantages is that you do not enjoy the same tax benefits as you would receive from retirement funds. Certain financial institutions, such as Charles Schwab, Fidelity, Vanguard, and TD Ameritrade, are among those who provide brokerage accounts to their customers. The advantages of working with a traditional brokerage typically include the availability of a greater variety of account types, such as individual retirement accounts IRAs, or custodial accounts for kids, as well as the opportunity to speak with a representative over the phone and, in some instances, in person if you have any issues. On the other hand, there are some drawbacks, such as the fact that some traditional brokerages could be a little bit slower to incorporate new technologies or specialized investing opportunities such as cryptocurrencies. As an illustration, financial technology startups such as Robinhood and M1 Finance provided investors with the opportunity to purchase fractional shares many years before traditional brokerages did so. Another alternative for brokerage accounts is a robo-advisor, which is ideal for individuals who have well-defined and uncomplicated objectives in terms of their investments. When compared to the fees charged by a human financial advisor, the costs charged by robo-advisors are far lower. Additionally, robo-advisors automatically rebalance your portfolio. 
There is a possibility that a robo-advisor is not the ideal choice for you if you have more complicated financial objectives and would like more individualized investment choices. Creating a brokerage account and depositing money into it is not considered investing. This is a crucial point to keep in mind. When new investors make the error of assuming that opening an account and contributing money is sufficient, they are making a typical mistake. However, the final step is to conduct a buy transaction. 3. Calculate how much money you want to invest. You should take into consideration the quantity of money that you intend to put in each form of investment account when you make your decision on which investment accounts you wish to open. The amount of money that you put into each account will be determined by the investment objective that you outlined in the first phase, as well as the period of time that you have until you want to achieve that goal. A time horizon is the term used to describe this. There may also be restrictions on the amount of money that can be invested in particular accounts. You should determine a certain amount of your income that you are able to allocate to the development of your portfolio. If you started saving later in your career or if you want to retire earlier, you may want to consider contributing a higher percentage of your income to achieve your retirement objectives. The usual rule of thumb for retirement goals is to invest 15% of your income each year. Make sure you keep in mind that 15% also takes into account any matches that your employer may provide for you. Consequently, if you were to contribute 10% of your W-2 income and receive a match of 5% from your employer, you would have a total contribution of 15%, which would allow you to meet this criterion. If you are living paycheck to paycheck, 15% may appear to be an absurd amount to invest in your financial future. Don't freak out, it's perfectly fine to begin with a modest amount, even if it's just 1%. To ensure that your money continues to increase over time, the most important thing is to get started. Create a plan for how you would like to invest your money. One of the most frequently asked questions is whether it is better to invest your money all at once or to invest it in equal quantities over a period of time, which is more usually referred to as dollar cost averaging DCA. Both of these choices come with their own set of benefits and drawbacks. In order to ensure that you are consistently spending toward a goal and, presumably, Profiting from purchases made at both higher and lower trading prices. Dollar cost averaging is a helpful method that may be utilized for medium to long-term goals. It is not about timing the market, but time in the market, explains Tara Falcone, CFA, CFP, creator and CEO of Reason, a goal-based investing app. Falcone is also a certified financial planner and public accountant. Dollar cost averaging is a strategy that can be useful for investing, especially when applied to relatively small amounts. However, there are certain drawbacks associated with TCA. Due to the fact that the market has historically increased over time, it is more likely that you will receive a bigger return if you had invested a lump sum at the beginning of the process. When compared to dollar cost averaging, the facts indicate that investing the entire sum all at once is the superior option. Lauren M. Mistrad, a certified financial planner, certified financial analyst, and senior portfolio manager at TruePoint Wealth Council, explains that investing the entire sum of money at once allows you to reach your target allocation instantly and, as a result, has a better predicted return than if you had retained a portion of the money in cash. The term target allocation refers to the proportion of stocks and bonds that you should possess in accordance with your level of comfort with risk and the length of time that you intend to invest. As a result of the fact that the majority of people do not own substantial sums of money that they can invest in the market all at once, dollar cost averaging is typically the default choice. When it comes to investing, it is better to get started right away and not waste any time than it is to wait for the ideal moment, when the market is just right, when all of your financial ducks are in a row, etc., which is something that is highly unlikely to ever come about. Even if you choose to invest with a single quantity of money, it is still helpful to continue adding to your investments on a consistently regular basis. Taking this action will provide your portfolio with additional options to continue expanding. 4. Measure your risk tolerance. The term risk tolerance refers to the amount of risk that an investor is ready to take in exchange for the possibility of a significantly larger return. The extent to which you are willing to take risks is one of the most significant aspects that will determine the assets that you include in your portfolio. It is necessary for an investor to first determine their level of comfort with risk, also known as volatility, before making a decision regarding the level of portfolio risk that they wish to pursue, as stated by Neistrat. When they see the S&P 500 drop over 24% as it has this year, 
Does it make them nervous to invest? She asks further. Did it make them nervous to invest? The answers to these questions are significant due to the fact that some assets are typically more volatile than others. One method for determining how much risk you are willing to face is to fill out a risk tolerance questionnaire. According to the responses that you choose, these are normally a brief set of survey questions that will assist you in gaining an understanding of the level of risk that you are willing to take. When compared to stocks, a person who has a more conservative tolerance may have a greater proportion of their portfolio invested in bonds and cash. On the other hand, a person who has a more aggressive tolerance may have a greater proportion of their portfolio invested in stocks. While you are assessing your risk tolerance, it is important to keep in mind that it is not the same thing as your risk capacity. A measure of your readiness to take risks in exchange for higher returns is referred to as your risk tolerance. In essence, it is an estimation of the emotional response that you would bring about in response to losses and volatility. Risk capacity, on the other hand, refers to the amount of risk that an individual is able to take without incurring financial hardship.